Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, your son came to this world to save it so long ago. And as we begin the season of Advent, we look forward to the day when he will come again to save us and the whole world. And so at this time, we join the early church in saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. And as we think about the first Sunday of Advent, many of us think about, oh, great, Christmas is right around the corner. And so we buy our Advent wreaths, we have our Advent calendars, we light our Advent um, candles, all looking forward to Christmas. And yet that's not what Advent is about. Advent is not about looking back to Christmas. I'm sure we do a little bit of that but it's really to help us look forward to Jesus' second advent when he will come again. And that's why our reading today doesn't look at the manger, but instead Jesus is speaking about the end times. And as he's doing that, we find him in Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Jesus is speaking about when the Son of Man will come again. Now, if you're like me, talking about that makes you a little nervous, because it's a little scary when we think about Jesus' return. I mean, in, in Matthew 24, we hear of the temple being destroyed. We hear of false messiahs. We're told to be ready and be alert. And so we're trying to be alert, be ready for when he'll come again. And that can be very scary. And yet in the midst of all these words, there's this little promise, a, a verse of hope for us, as we're waiting for Jesus to appear. And it's found in Matthew 24, verse 37. Jesus says, As the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now why this is filled with hope is because Noah is a great passage for us. Noah is a, a typology for us. Noah can help us understand how and what the end times are going to look like. And when I think of Noah, Noah doesn't scare me. I love Noah. I love Noah because as a kid, you would sing songs and you'd have little pictures or, or toys of Noah and the ark. Back when I was a little kid, uh, we didn't have a, sh a bathtub, but we had a shower and I had a little floating Noah ark. So what we did was we, we covered the drain of the shower and I got a float in about this much of water, like three inches of water, Noah's Ark. And I played with Noah's Ark because Noah's the best. Even growing up, I had a song that I learned. It was, the Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. Do you remember the next line? Get those children out of the muddy, muddy children of the Lord. Right? Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Anyway, it's that phrase, get those children out of the muddy, muddy, children of the Lord. That's the hope. When Jesus came the first time, and what Noah's Ark shows us, and then Jesus came the first time, and what his second coming is about, it's about rescuing us from the muddy, muddy. The problem, of course, is that we as humans love that muddy-muddy. Back in Noah's day, in Genesis 6, it says that, that the, the generation, the people living in that time, they were corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And yet things haven't changed in our time. We have corruption all over the place, corrupt politicians, corrupt business practices. We have corrupt sports, corrupt college admission scandals. I mean, there's corruption all over the place. And there's also, unfortunately, violence. The war in Ukraine just continues and continues. The shooting at Club Q, the shooting at Walmart, the massacre in Idaho. I mean, there's violence all around us. Some of us have been affected by such violence. We need rescue from the muddy, muddy. And unfortunately, we don't know how. It's like we can't stop it. 
And so that reference to Noah then is almost, or it is, a way of God saying and Jesus saying to us, just as Noah was rescued, so too will you. And the best part of it is, you don't have to bring it about. The people in, in Noah's day didn't bring about the flood, nor could they stop the flood. And for our day, we can't bring about the second coming, nor can we stop it. It's, it's kind of like that child game of tag when you'd say, ready or not, here I come. That's how it is with Jesus' second coming. Ready or not, I'm coming. And that is good news. Because it means that it's not about us. Instead, it's for us. And yet, how are we to be ready? How are we to be ready for when he comes again? Well, Jesus goes on to, to talk to us. And he gives these words. He says, but about the day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In other words, if a pastor says, I know when God's coming again, or a friend or a relative, don't listen to him, because even Jesus doesn't know when his return is. But then Jesus goes further. He says, you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, this is kind of hard to understand because what he's saying is, you don't know when, but be ready. And that's kind of a, a weird thought. I mean, imagine it this way. We might think of it this way. Imagine your parents saying, hey, Get ready, we're going to go to Disneyland. And then we asked, well, when? And they said, don't know, but be ready. You can see what can happen with that. Suddenly, like two days later, a friend goes, hey, do you want to spend the night? And you're like, I want to, but we might be going to Disneyland in the morning. Or someone else says, hey, do you want to play baseball? I want to, but... We might be leaving to Disneyland soon, right? So this idea of not knowing but being ready can paralyze a person. I think that's why a lot of us are paralyzed about the second coming of Jesus. We know he's coming, and we're called to be ready, but what does that mean? How do we do that? And while we're waiting, it can almost be overwhelming because we get all kinds of thoughts in our heads, like, why hasn't he come yet? What happens when he does come? Will I be judged with the wicked? Is Jesus really enough what he did on the cross? Like, all these thoughts come. What will heaven be like? Will I like it? And so we get stuck, thinking about a future and not quite sure that we really want it. So this is where Noah can be helpful again. And this is where the people of, of Israel can be helpful again. Because for the people of Israel, they knew how to wait with hope. And we see this in Psalm 130. Psalm 130 says this, I wait for the Lord, and the word for wait is kavah. Then it says, my soul waits, kavah. And in his word I hope, which is ti kavah. Hear that kava, kava, ti kava? It's the same word, just with a little. And for them, they understood that waiting and hoping belong together. And the way that we, we wait with hope is holding on to the promises of God's word. And that brings us back to Noah. That's what Noah did. He waited with hope because he trusted the one who made the promise. He knew that God was going to take care of him. He knew that God was going to deliver him from the flood. And so he waited with hope. He, he worked probably very hard in building the ark. But on some days when it was going slow, he never had to be afraid of that. Because he knew God was going to deliver him at just the right time. 
Corey Ten Boom understood this and shared an illustration that I think is really helpful. She said as a girl, she would go with her dad to Amsterdam to set their watches because the dad was a watchmaker and, a, and would repair watches. And so they'd get on the train, but before they'd go, she would always say to her dad, Dad, when do I get the ticket? I want to make sure I have the ticket for the train. And her father would always say, you'll get it at just the right time. And so she'd be ready, she'd be a little anxious, she'd be a little nervous, but she knew that when she sat down and when the person came to collect the tickets, her father would pull out the ticket, give it to her, so she could give it to the person on the train. That's how it works with God. That's what hoping, waiting with hope is. It's waiting. We know it's going to happen. But it's the hope that the God who made this promise will give us exactly what we need at the very moment we need it. And we know that because in the waters of baptism, we were united to Jesus. Jesus gave us himself fully. And in the Lord's Supper, he gives us fully of himself for forgiveness, for a future, for strength, all of it. Because our Father knows what we need. That's how we can have hope as we wait. Because we have promises, we have the word to hold on to. And God will give us exactly what we need at exactly the moment we need it. Now with all this waiting, does that mean... Uh, we do nothing as we're waiting? No. Remember, what did Noah do while he was waiting? He built an ark. What do we do? Well, we build the church. And what I mean by that is we, we baptize, we, we share the gospel, we, we teach in Sunday school, we pray, we sing. And not only that on, on, on Sundays, but as we go out into this world, we do all kinds of things. We have vocations and jobs and callings. We're, we're sons and daughters. We're neighbors. We're friends. We help each other knowing that we've been loved by God and we have a future with God. And so we can live freely into that. So we share that with our neighbors. Some of our neighbors join us. But what we don't have to be is paralyzed. We can work knowing that we don't usher it in. We can work knowing that, that God will come, ready or not, here I come. And we can work knowing that he will give us exactly what we need the moment we need it. That's how Noah is a, is a picture for us when Jesus comes again. And yet there's still more mercy to find. Because the sign of Noah for us is so important because after the flood, what did Noah do? Well, first he kind of like, he was wrecked by it. And so he planted a vineyard and got drunk. I mean, he probably had a lot to like go through. But then he realized what God had for him was a whole new beginning with a whole new world that was filled with life. And that's what awaits us, is a whole new beginning. The end of Jesus coming on the last days is really the end to this world with its corruption and its violence. And it's the beginning of a new day. But here's where some mercy was awesome, though. Because for Peter, as he thought about that new day and thought about what Jesus did, for Peter, he couldn't help but think, what about that generation that died in the flood? And what Peter tells us is that when Jesus died on the cross, he went into Sheol, he went into hell, he went into the deep, he went into the ground. And there he preached to all those who had been imprisoned before Jesus came, to all of those inhabitants of the flood. And Jesus preached to them to get them out of the muddy, muddy. And if Jesus came to get them out of the muddy, muddy, 
because of his grace and mercy. That's what he's going to do for you and for me. And so he says, get on to this ark. I put you on it in baptism. So live into this. You have a great future. And with whatever comes your way until that day, I will shelter you from any storm. So be of good cheer. Rejoice and get yourself ready. And then join what the early church has said and prayed for 2,000 years. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.